this is going to be the puppet master, so how I'm able to pull strings inside your organization. If I start talking too fast and it's hard for translation, just put your hands up and I'll slow down, okay? <laughs> so let's first start about the evolution of hacking. So when I started hacking, I was nine years old. Okay, I've disclosed over 100,000 vulnerabilities worldwide in leading infrastructure, in websites, uh, exploits, zero days. So I'm autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, so you know, I struggle with certain elements. But when it comes to computing, um, you know, I find it much more easier to talk to a computer than a person. Because um, if you talk to a person, it's quite complex. You ask them a question, and they ask why. They don't give you the response, whereas computers give you the response that you need. So when I started hacking, um, you know, at the age of nine, it was almost, you know, it was just me, myself, and I. There was a community online. There was a large following and uh, uh, groups and, and organizations online, but, you know, it was predominantly just about me. And the way that I kind of perceive things is we was the Banksies of the cyber world. So almost like Banksy, you know, he sprays his artwork and then he moves on. Well, nobody knows who he is, right? Um, but it's his art that leaves behind, you know, uh, something in history. So when I was hacking websites and hacking web servers, you know, I'd change the page and I'd put some digital graffiti, you know, on the website. But I wasn't nasty, I wasn't malicious. You know, I didn't set out to make a profit or extort money. Sometimes I'd even leave notes for the web developers to teach them, you know, how I was able to break into their infrastructure and leave them a little message. And sometimes they took it the right way or the wrong way, but it depends on that individual. But it's evolved to where we're seeing now, you know, numerous uh, political organizations ar uh, around the world, political groups, sorry, starting up. So we're all familiar with the anonymous mask, yes? We're all familiar with the, the mask that we see in the media, and, um, and that's how we perceive it. But, you know, I went from the being the individual, so hacking on my own, to joining these groups and joining these organizations for their causes, and then leaving their political message. So this one's from the Moroccan hackers, okay? It's a group in Morocco that have left their tags on numerous uh, websites around uh, Scientology and wars that are going on around the world. But now, you know, it's going on to organized business cybercrime. So there are office blocks around the world that are getting set up, you know, primarily to hack companies to hack rival infrastructures. Okay, so a lot of our uh, equipment is manufactured there. It's made in, you know, you know the country that I'm talking about. And, you know, these office blocks, they have a, a large amount of staff and a large amount of following. And, you know, their primary goal is to hack rival companies and steal their information. But these guys pay a salary. You know, they pay, they have KPIs, they have targets that they have to meet but they're still hacking maliciously. So it's gone from the singular to the groups to now where we've got massive organized business cybercrime that's forking up around the world. But this is what we see as being a hacker. You know, This is what the media tells us. It's, um, I'm sure you guys have seen the Die Hard movie, you know, where you've got Warlock that sat in his mum's basement and you've got all the you know, lights on inside of his house because it's the end of the world, okay? Well, that's what you guys perceive as and that's what the media show as being hackers. They never show the ethical guys, or the, the white hat guys, or the guys that protect you. The way that I see it is you need police to protect your physical security. You need ethical hackers to protect your online security. But, so we see that as being in the basement, but you know, I was in my mum's attic, so it's the complete opposite. You know, it's the complete different perception. But it could be anyone around you. It could be someone in the, this audience, okay? It could be someone that you work with. It could be a disgruntled employee, you know, some individual that you might not even know that's into technology some ex-employee, so we need to you know, focus and, uh, and think about that. Now let's talk about ransomware. So this is the very first ransomware variation that came out. It was in 1989, and it cost $189 to be sent you know, via the post to Panama, which is ridiculous, right? You know, nowadays we've got cryptocurrencies, you know, we've got uh, new coins coming up like B3, a really great project, and numerous different projects that are being influenced around cryptocurrency. But again, you know, they sent that via the post, $189, where it's kind of, it's, it's ironic because the evolution side of things is what we're seeing now. So we're seeing the digital ransomware, you know, not the sent through the post. And this one, you know, it, you have to pay via cryptocurrency. But do you know what's actually funny of how it's evolved? You get a live chat support link now. If you get infected with ransomware, you can go through to a call center and they will teach you how to get your files back. So the hackers provided that for you guys, you know, the malicious guy. But not only that, he will give you a free phone number that you can call to go through to a call center again that will teach you how to buy cryptocurrencies, that will teach you how to get your files back. But I recommend you do not pay, okay? Under any circumstances, if you get ransomware, you do not pay, okay? Because if you have an exploit in your system, once you've paid, 
the exploit's still there. They're not going to tell you how they infected you, and six months down the line, you'll get reinfected. But this is what we're seeing, you know, quite recently. Again, this is uh, hackers, you know, logging into iCloud accounts, and once they've logged into your account, they're then clicking "lost my iPhone" or "lost my MacBook," and instead of putting the note like "please ring my partner" or "please ring my mother if you found my device," they're saying "send me Bitcoin." And so <laughs> let's talk about what social engineering is. So I'm going to briefly kind of touch on it, and Jessica, you know, uh, is going to go into far more detail. But it's the art of manipulation for information. It's a cyber attack that relies on minimal technological intervention. So normally it's me, myself, and I, OK? And again, it's also social engineering is known uh, as uh, the human decision making, known as the cognitive biases. So it's bugs within the human hardware. So the best way to describe it, OK, imagine you're going through a supermarket and you get to the end of the till, OK? And there's a lady or a gentleman on the till and they say, oh, they, they never have any carrier bags. They don't say we, sorry, we never have any carrier bags. That two tiny word between they and we shows me their ins insight into how they're feeling there and then. So can they be exploited? Can they be targeted? Are they a high up employee? You know, if they use the word we, then they might be a high up employee because they're treating it as a family orientation, a family organization. But if they say, sorry, they, it's probably a low level employee or someone that's not been there too long. And you know, this is how it happens. So again, we have, to defend, uh, sorry, we have to define our end goal or motivation. So your company would come to me and come to other social engineers and say, you know, um, we want you to break into our infrastructure by any means necessary without causing physical damage or distress. That's normally my perimeters. So I can't make people cry, and I can't hit the fire alarm, but I can do pretty much anything else inside the organization. And after we've defined exactly what it is that you guys want me to do, we have to do online reconnaissance. So part of the online reconnaissance would be to you know, uh, go through uh, records online, you know, company records, go through your social media profiles, your, so, you know, your social media accounts, look at your images that you guys upload, see where you were stood at that given moment in time, um, go through the data, try and you know, get the EXIF data out of that, and it actually shows you longitude and latitude. So I can learn so much about you guys online because you're always posting on social media. How many people here today have posted on LinkedIn? or posted on Facebook or Twitter that they're here, put your hands up. Well done, interaction, I like interaction. Okay, and you know, again, we have to profile physical and human targets. So looking at how you act, how you are influenced, you know, uh, what's your persona, what, do you have a Rolex, right? Do you have your nice shoes? Are you a senior executive, are you in sales? We give that information away all the time without us actually knowing about it. And then gathering information, so that's offline and online reconnaissance. You know, it's, uh, you guys give out business cards, so we're going to do some phone hacking later on. So I'm going to give you some live demonstrations of how easy it is to trick you on your devices. Select different attack vectors we'll cover in the next slide. Overcome moral or ethical dilemmas. Now that's difficult, you know, because you, you can't make people upset. You can't make people feel on edge, but you can prod to get answers. And we as people give away so much information without us knowing. So that could be me going for a cigarette you know, with uh, individuals in a company. And every day, they see me having a cigarette with them. So on the fourth day, they open the door for me because they think that I'm part of that organization. Then we'll launch an attack. But at any given time, I'm launching up to 40 different attacks, sometimes even more. You know, that could be uh, phishing. It could be email campaigns. It could be voicemail hacking. It could be phone hacking. You know? But I can only hack business devices. Different attack vectors, so diversion theft, you know? Uh, excuse me, you forgot your change in a coffee shop. It works all the time, right? It still happens and still around. Or when we're traveling on a train and we're going to the shop on the train, we slowly close our laptop till it's half open and half closed. You know, we think no one's gonna touch it, let's just leave it there. But I have a USB with me here today that I can plug into your machines and we in three seconds will pull all your passwords, your credentials, your VPN credentials. Three seconds, you know? I don't even have to be on the device. Phishing, we see that all the time. You know, different email campaigns. Uh, baiting, dropping USB pens you know, near your parked cars. Dropping USB pens outside your offices. If you see it on the floor and it's got your company logo on it, and it says confidential, you'll just pick it up and you'll plug it in. Even though your company says don't do it, you will do it, right? <laughs> Uh, baiting, you know, tailgating, we've, uh, so following people into organizations. We open the door because we want to help people. You know, we want to be egocentric. We want to show that we care. But we don't think about the policies and procedures. Wireless access point we'll cover later on. 
QR codes, you know, it's dangerous. Scanning QR codes around. If you have a vulnerable device you've not updated, or an iPhone 4, or an iPhone 5, right? And you've not updated it, or an Android version. Again, you know, it's potentially, you can intercept data from that device. Uh, infectious media, just get going to conferences and picking up USB pens, picking up battery chargers and phone chargers, because we want that free stuff. But we don't think about the security implications of it. Phone spoofing, we'll cover later on. Exploiting public information. Records online about your company. You know, anything that you post online is seen by everyone. You, know, you just have to look around. Ears dropping, listening to conversations. You know, when you're having a chat with individuals, do you really care when people are hearing what you're saying? Well, half the time, no. You just say it. You don't think about the implications. And badge surfing, going to, you know, um, on eBay, buying NHS or buying National Health Service or buying uniforms. It's easily obtainable. I mean, this is me, you know, dressed up in a uniform from a hotel chain. I served 2,500 delegates, people like you guys, right? tea and biscuits all day, and I was a speaker at that event. They had no idea that I was a speaker, but I learned so much information about them throughout the day, and you guys are horrible to conference staff, okay? I learned that out. And after serving them tea and biscuits, you know, I learned their phone pins on their devices. You know, I learned if they had a family, you know, if they had kids. I learned what they liked to do in their spare time, and when they'd had a drink, I learned so much information. You know, it was chief risk officers for banks, and they was openly saying to each other, they failed an audit. Imagine if that went into the news or went into the media. So I stumbled on stage with plates and they said, get off, you know, Jamie Woodruff on the stage, get off the stage. And I dropped the plates and I said, no, I'm Jamie Woodruff. And the faces dropped all the way around the room. Another one, you know, Royal Mail in the, in the UK. This is a really, you know, mostly used courier service with FedEx and DPD. Again, 40 euros, you know, on eBay just to get a, a, a uniform, Royal Mail. They even give me some free shorts <laughs> as part of the deal. You know, again, a, you know, it's easily obtainable and it's easy uh, to access. You know, you can buy uh, cabin crew uniforms. You can buy any type of uniform from across industry. But if you guys saw me dressed up like this, would you question it? Probably not. So now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Kim Kardashian, this is the most clothed picture I could find of Kim Kardashian, so. <laughs> And, you know, I'm known for hacking Kim Kardashian, so I disclosed an exploit that um, she had 52 million accounts that were vulnerable. And I wrote to her team, okay, and, and they ignored me. So I said, you know, you've got 30 days or I'm going public. And they said, okay, that's fine, we're not interested. 30 days I went public, I got published in CNN, published in BBC, news outlets all the way around the world. And six days later she had a brand new website, she had a brand new app that she launched. But imagine how many accounts, you know, and then passwords and usernames would be the same. Because we always use passwords that are the same. We have one password that we've had for years that we constantly use and we don't think about. But again, once that one device has been compromised and that one password, that's all your accounts. You know, your eBay, your PayPal, everything. Mark Zuckerberg, I've disclosed numerous vulnerabilities in Facebook over the years. Um, you know, when I was young, like 14, 13. And, you know, again, they have responsible disclosure schemes. So they encourage hackers, white hat hackers, to hack their infrastructure. They encourage the good guys like me to find bugs in their infrastructure. And they reward us, ironically, with hoodies when I said ignore the perception of a hacker. But they give us hoodies. <laughs> and again, so you guys need to look at responsible disclosure scheme. Or routine. What time do you guys wake up in the morning? Shout out. 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m.? Put your hands up if you wake up at 6 a.m. That is really bad. <laughs> I wake up at 10 a.m. <laughs> and you wake up and you go downstairs. You speak to your wife or you, your children and you have breakfast. Then you get in the car and you might drop your children off at work. Uh, sorry, at college. Uh, sorry, at school, not work. Not yet. And again, you arrive there at roughly the same time. You have a preferred parking spot that you enjoy or a preferred location that you drop them off. Then you get in the car and drive to work the same route. You arrive at work at roughly the same time. You get out the car and you interact with the same people and you get my point. After three, four days of me watching you, I know where you're gonna be. You're predictable, very predictable. So be observant of your surroundings, you know, from a subliminal perspective, but also from an awareness perspective. So again, our routines are flawed, but you know, someone could be tailgating you, someone could be watching you. So again, be aware of your surroundings. 
The safest method of communication nowadays is a carrier pigeon. Okay? You are less likely um, to get your uh, 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 emails intercepted via a pigeon than you are nowadays. Okay, it's just a bit of fun. But it's the same. We send an email, we think it goes to that person. It doesn't. It goes through numerous different hops before it reaches the destination. So that's numerous potential interception points before the data arrives. So when you're on a public Wi-Fi like today, make sure you use a VPN, a virtual private network. It's really important. Who's got any IoT devices? Have you got Alexa? Put your hands up. Have you got OK Google in your house? No? OK, that's good. But we buy them. Did you know you can get a smart bed that will tell you if your partner's cheating on you while you're at a conference? Do you think I'm joking? Go on Google. See for yourself. That's a ridiculous piece of IoT, the Internet of Things. But it exists. But the dangerous element behind that is, you know, your weight distribution, are you snoring, are you settled? All that data can get resold from the primary purpose. So be aware of that. Because as we're seeing, who's seen this in the media recently? You know, have you seen this on the news? Who here has purchased one of these for devices for their kids? Put your hands up. Kayla the doll. A few. This doll can listen to your conversations inside your house. This, ch this children's toy. Hackers can take control of this device and make her say things that she wouldn't normally say. They can listen for keywords like bank statement or credit card or um, you know, keywords and then store that data for a hacker to see. And this is a children's toy. And then we reached out to them and told them, look, this is what you can happen. And what did they do? They said, remember to turn IQ off when he's not being played with. This will preserve his batteries. <laughs> No, it's because they can listen into the conversations. And now the fourth problem. So this, 11 characters of code can bring down some of the world's most securest infrastructures. Now, I'm not telling you this so you can have time off work, OK? I'm telling you this because this is dangerous. Now, this should be fixed. This has been around for many years and works in multiple languages. And if you were to run this on your machine, it would crash that machine and every machine on that network. But the, the reason why I explain this is because the IT guy should have fixed this, OK? But he didn't, because it's my way or the highway. That's what the IT guy normally says, the one that's focusing on database architecture or structure, not on cybersecurity. So you need to have the cybersecurity guy. You need to have the relevant individual in the organization. Google dorks will cover at the end. Um, so I need two volunteers. Can I have two volunteers, please? <laughs> Feel free. Come to the front, please. Can I have one more volunteer, please? I believe this lady's single, so if someone wants her number, you can. <laughs> can I have a volunteer? I need one more. One more. Sir, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. There we go. <laughs> OK. Do you have your phones? Yes. Yes, do you? It doesn't matter if you don't. OK. So I'm going to explain to you what I'm doing, but just bear with me for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, OK? So your phone is in your bag. And your, it's upstairs, OK. So, and your phone's here. So what is your number? Uh, I need plus 44 or plus 31. Um, so plus uh, 33. Three. Yep. One. Yep. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> here. Yeah. What's your mother's maiden name? No, um, <laughs> um, you were going to tell me then, wasn't you? Uh, what's your number, sorry? Can you plus? This feels so dangerous because you're going to It's not dangerous. Now. I'll explain to you what it is. OK. This is consent. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. OK. So do you want to pull out your phone? And I'll explain to you exactly what I'm doing when it occurs, OK? This is how easy it is. So now you'll have her number so you can talk. <laughs> so this is. Whose number is that? Is that yours? Yes. What happened? Oh, you called. I called him. Yeah. <laughs> Will I see that on my phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will see that I called him. <laughs> so I just called him, this gentleman, from this lady's phone that's upstairs in her bag. OK, thank you. Are you single? 
Yeah, there you go. Good man. So, thank you. Um, so as you can see, how easy is that? Okay, so I was able to call him from her phone that's upstairs, and I've never met them before. And this is not staged. There's nothing up my sleeves, right? <laughs> but again, that is simple. If you received a call on your phone from another office that your company owns, and you knew the number, would you give away information? Yeah, because it looks legitimate. What if I told you that that's a free app on the App Store that anybody can download in this room? on their iPhone or Android. It's not trickery, it's a free app. It's not hacking. But how dangerous is that? If I called the individual's phone from his phone again, it would say, welcome to your voicemail. You have six new messages, if I called him from his own number. How many people in here have a voicemail pin? Put your hands up. One, out of the entire room, one, exactly. A pineapple. You know, you can buy this online for 125 euros. This device will force all your phones and laptops in the audience to connect to it. It's legal to buy, but it's illegal to use, which is kind of ironic, isn't it, really? But one by one, your phones will connect because, you know, from the moment that your phone was manufactured, it's always looking for known networks. It's always looking for Starbucks. It's always looking for McDonald's. When we go home, it connects. But it's dangerous because... We don't forget the network after we've left, you know? We leave it on the device. And again, it can intercept your emails. It can see your calendar, potentially, just by you not even knowing about it or not even being aware about it. So again, use a VPN. A Windows firewall, ladies and gentlemen. So we spend millions of pounds on this infrastructure, but we forget you know, our employees, and our employees are the hedges, okay? So we throw all our money at this, but we forget our employees. You need to make them aware. You need to make them you know, to, to be trained uh, about cybersecurity because they are the first line of defense and also the last line of defense. Okay? Forget the firewall. It's important, but so are your employees. Personal security. Who has children in here? Put your hands up. Who's give them an iPad or a tablet to keep them quiet? <laughs> Who set the pin to 12345 or 11111? A few. Exactly. We teach them about strangers in public, but we don't teach them about online security. Have you ever sat down with your child and talked to him about ransomware? No. Why should you? You know? But it's important that we do because I work with the Cyber Smile Foundation as an advisor with uh, numerous heads of Facebook, Twitter, uh, and YouTube, and Google. And we've seen you know, a large rise in teenage suicides related to ransomware you know, that could have been prevented. So in this case, this individual played Minecraft, and he got bullied in real life. And he built this castle in Minecraft, and people destroyed it. Okay, So he downloaded a tool, and that tool got installed and infected his home network you know, with ransomware. He said that he was looking at indecent images online, you know, and it demanded that he make a payment. He didn't understand ransomware. You know, and how many teenagers would go to their family or go to their teachers and say, my computer says I'm looking at indecent images? Not a lot, right? And in this case, he took his own life. So we need to educate our children. Cybersecurity starts in your home life just like it starts in your corporate life. It becomes second nature. Thank you very much, guys. I'm the CTO of uh, Metrics Cloud. I'm an advisor for Accenture. I'm the cyber safety advisor for the Cyber Smile Foundation, and that's my Twitter. I'm, a thousand off a hundred thousand followers. So if you could follow me, that'd be great. Thank you. So I'm talking about the human side of cybersecurity. Before I get started, just very quickly introduce myself. I'm um, the co-founder of a company in the UK called Redacted Firm. And we look at cybersecurity from the technical, the human, and the physical dimensions. So cybersecurity, as I said um, when we were introduced, is not just about the technical side of things. It's really about the protection of information in its, in its whole. 
Um, so I'm the co-founder of Redacted Firm. I work on our socio-technical um, side of the business, which is essentially a fancy way of saying where people meet technology. I've worked as a senior consultant. I've worked as the head of awareness um, with regards to cybersecurity. And I've also worked on the investigations and disputes side of things. So when an organization gets hacked um, or when an organization loses data, trying to understand what's happened there. But you didn't come here to listen to my CV. Um, and I'm conscious that coming to speak to you all, you all work together, you all know each other to some extent. So I thought before you listen to me talk about cybersecurity, I would introduce a little bit more about who I really am. So I am Dr. Jessica Barker. Of course, I am not this kind of doctor, nor am I this kind of doctor. I am, in fact, this kind of doctor. So I can't help when something like this happens. Because, of course, my work is much more serious. I work in cybersecurity, but I am not one of these. I am not one of these, and I don't often go to work dressed like this. I don't know if you have a thing uh, in France called Casual Friday. <laughs> in the UK, we dress down on a Friday, so that's my Friday look. Um, my background, quite unusually, for cybersecurity is in sociology, um, and so I very much look at the human side of cybersecurity. Working primarily as a consultant, I'm often asked, what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, of course, as a consultant, I write the word success on transparent walls. I'm really good at jigsaw puzzles, and I get a lot of high fives and fist bumps. Yeah. I'm really good at high fives and fist bumps. You'll have to take my word for it, but I am. So that means I get to do a lot of stuff like this. So I do lots of speaking about cybersecurity, and I also quite frequently comment in the news. So when there is a data breach, when there is a cyber attack and it hits the headlines, um, the BBC or whoever will ring me up and ask for me to give the non-technical, understandable version of what has happened. So that means you might sometimes turn on your TV and see me talking about cybersecurity, which means you will see me looking shocked. You'll see me looking angry. <laughs> you'll see me looking disappointed. And on a really bad day, you'll see me looking really sad. Working in cybersecurity does regularly make you feel shocked, angry, disappointed, and sad. So you have to let off steam. You have to have hobbies. And so I let off steam by doing stuff like this, and doing stuff like this, and making stuff like this, which is an alarm clock, not a bomb, and making stuff like this, which is an excuse to use a hammer. So <laughs> now you know a bit more about me, on to the main um, body of my talk. And that is about trying to convey what it means to work on the human side of cybersecurity and what we have to think about to understand people and how they interact with security. So as I said at the start, cybersecurity is not just technical, despite what we might see in the media and despite what the name implies. Um, it's often said that cybersecurity is about people, process, and technology. So it's a triangle, and it's about understanding how these things work together. So when we think about cybersecurity, one of the first things that people will usually want to ask about or want to understand is who are the attackers? Um, who are the people or groups out there behind some of the crimes and the problems that we see. And so we see different types of attackers, and they have different motives. They will target different companies or organizations, and they'll have different methods. Typically, the kind of attackers we see will fall into groups like cyber warfare, which of course has hit the headlines to a much greater extent over the last couple of years um, with the US election and of course the French election. And lots of comment about um, Macron's team being targeted um, in the run-up to the election um, as part of cyber warfare and actually the team doing a really good job to defend themselves against that attack or those attacks. We have financially motivated cybercrime, which Jamie touched on in his presentation. And financially motivated cybercrime is the largest proportion of crime that we see online. The latest statistics, and statistics are never correct, um, certainly not in cybersecurity, but the latest statistics suggest that about 83% of cybercrime is carried out 
um, by financially motivated criminals. And increasingly, these are organized criminal gangs. They have offices. They, have, they are run like a business with sales teams, HR teams, uh, different heads of businesses. Um, and it's the kind of organized criminal gangs that have always carried out crime, but now understand that carrying out crime on the internet is faster, cheaper, quicker, more effective, and less risky than, re than crime in the real world. We have the hacktivist groups, so these are the groups that were particularly dominant a few years ago, um, anonymous, lulsec, carrying out attacks online as part of online activism. So not financially motivated, but trying to make a political point. We have what's known as the script kiddies. Has anybody heard of this term before, script kiddies? Yeah, I thought we'd have one. <laughs> I'd be worried if Jamie didn't put his hand up. So script kiddies are stereotypically teenagers, but they often are teenagers, and they are not hackers in the typical sense. They're not trained, they're not skilled. What they're doing is using other people's code. So they go online, they go onto YouTube um, and you know watch videos that give demonstrations in how to do hacking. They download tools and then they carry out attacks with those tools. And script kiddies have been behind some of the biggest attacks we've seen in the last few years. So for example, TalkTalk, Talk, a big UK telecommunications company, hit the headlines a couple of years ago, suffered what was not a big data breach, but that got them a lot of bad publicity, partly over how they handled it. It lost them about 100,000 customers, called, caused them um, a lot of financial loss, and it was a 15, 16-year-old boy in the UK behind that initial attack, and he said he did it to impress his friends. So we have all sorts of different kinds of attackers. Um, but we see different methods of attack. Some of them, like the TalkTalk Talk attack, will be technically based. But others are using social engineering. And Jamie gave a good introduction to what social engineering is. Social engineering is about manipulating people to get access to information or information or funds from them. Social engineering, of course, is as old as time. We used to call it con artistry. And um, we've seen social engineering morph now that we are more connected, now that we have cyberspace. So social engineering can take place in the physical world. It can be somebody manipulating you to get into a building, for example. Um, or it can take place via telephone calls, or it can take place via emails, essentially any method of communication. One of the most prominent forms of social engineering takes place over emails. And this is what's known as phishing and spear phishing. Are people familiar with phishing? Yep. Are people familiar with spear phishing? Not so much. So spear phishing is phishing um, in its traditional sense, except it's targeted. So it's not just a blanket email that comes out. Instead, it will use your name. It may look like it comes from your friend, your colleague, your family member, your boss, um, a trusted bank you know, or an in other institution that you use. So it's targeted phishing. So it's social engineering that is targeted to you via email. And loads of organizations are being targeted with spear phishing attacks. Big organizations, small organizations, even the organizations that we think of as being the most technically savvy. And they're not really cyber attacks. They're more fraud carried out over email. Um, and we've seen a particular rise in one form, which is called CEO fraud um, or payment impersonation fraud. And so in the example we've got on screen, this is Facebook and Google, who were each conned out of $100 million each um, on the back of some spear phishing emails. These emails went in to individuals working in the finance team um, of these organizations, and they looked like they came from um, the boss or somebody very senior, and they said, um, we need you to transfer X amount of money to you know, a new supplier or a supplier that's changed their details, and we need you to do this really quickly. Um, looked like it came from the boss, and off the back of those emails, individuals and those two organizations transferred $100 million. Um, this is not unusual. We're seeing this take place all over the world. It's one of the biggest attack vectors that my clients are facing. 
and speaking of this, um, this is a sanitized version, so an anonymized version of an email that a client of ours received um, uh, probably about a year ago, maybe six months ago, um, and it prompted them to um, get in touch with us. So somebody in the finance department received a version of this email. Obviously, I've taken out all of the identifying information, so you can't tell who the client is. Um, but this email came in to somebody working in the finance department, looking like it came from the CEO, very much the same form of emails that go to Google, Facebook on the last page. And off the back of this email and off the back of the triggers that I've highlighted that made the individual feel like this transaction had to be made. It had to be made quickly. It had to be made discreetly. Um, the person who was, email, who was receiving the email was trusted and um, made to feel special. Um, off the back of this, they transferred the money. As soon as the individual had transferred the money, and this is a small business based in the UK, as soon as they transferred the money, the individual felt like something was wrong and that they shouldn't have done that. Um, but it was too late. By this point, the money was gone. And so this is very um, common form of attack. Another form of attack carried out by spear phishing emails is ransomware, and Jamie touched on this. So this is when your machine or your network or a series of um, devices in your network get locked down. You can no longer access the information, the files on there, and ransomware, um, and then you'll receive a, um, a note, a ransomware note. So ransomware is delivered um, via many different methods. Some are technical, but of course, some are spear phishing emails. Um, you click on a link, and then the next thing you know, your machine or your network is um, locked down. And ransomware, Jamie referred to the first sort of form of, of ransomware, but it has grown phenomenally over the last couple of years. So along with the spear phishing emails that I was talking about, looking like they come from your boss, it's the second largest attack that our clients are facing. And it's grown for many reasons. Um, of course, partly Bitcoin um, and other cryptocurrencies that allow the anonymous transfer of funds, or largely anonymous. Um, but also another reason is that it works. People pay the ransom because it's usually a small sum of money and usually people feel like it's worth taking the risk. So the latest stats suggest that 59% of companies pay the ransom if they are hit with ransomware, and actually 39% of payments are made by the individual in the organization. So they may not even be telling the boss, they may not be telling the finance team, they're paying out of their own pocket. Partly, I think, because they're embarrassed, and partly because they probably don't want the procurement headache of trying to process that transaction through an organization. And other forms of spear phishing um, will be about planting malware on your machine or will be about getting you to click on a link to go to a website to put your credentials in, to log in. And that's a way of harvesting your credentials from you. So there's lots of different forms of these kind of spear phishing emails that we see. But one thing we are seeing is a huge rise in them. So people ask me why. Why are um, is social engineering and spear phishing emails rising so much? And one thing, of course, is our connectivity. The fact that we get so many emails. The fact that we're all so connected to each other across the globe. But also, it's because the social engineering attacks work. And they work because they take advantage of traits in our psychology. So if we think of the human brain, we can understand um, from psychology, from behavioral economics, that the brain can essentially be split into two. And on one side of the brain, we have our rational side. We have our Dr. Spock. And Dr. Spock's side of our brain processes information carefully, thinks through about potential consequences, thinks about potential dangers, and makes a calculated decision. But all day, when we are making decisions, going about our business, we have Dr. Spock battling it out with the other side of our brain, which is, of course, Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson's side of our brain is impulsive, is emotionally driven, does not think about consequences, just thinks about the shiny, wonderful thing that clicking that link might lead them to. And this um, is known in behavioral economics, or it's described as being in a hot state. 
So when you can get an individual into what's known as a hot state, then they're more likely to make a decision with the homer side of their brain. When somebody's in a hot state, they don't think about potential consequences, they don't think about potential dangers, they make impulsive, emotionally driven decisions that often aren't the right decisions. So hot states include things like curiosity. If you can get somebody to feel curious about something, then they're more likely to just want to find out about it. So Jamie referred to the um, dropped USB sticks in a car park. If it's marked confidential, you're going to feel curious. You're going to want to plug it in. How curious are you going to feel if that USB stick is marked salaries and bonuses? <laughs> Pretty much everyone's going to plug that USB stick in. Another hot state is temptation. And we've seen temptation as the root cause of a lot of um, attacks on individuals, as the method of getting people to fall for social engineering attacks, particularly over social media. Jamie talked about teenagers, talked about needing to communicate with children and young people about cybersecurity, and one um, form of attack that's particularly important to talk about is known as sextortion. Sextortion is when an individual receives a friendship request, say on Facebook or another social media platform, and they won't know the individual, they won't recognize the picture, but it will be somebody that they would quite like to know, um, an attractive looking person who wants to make friends with them. So the individual receiving the friendship request, it could be a teenager, it could be an adult, these are targeted at everybody and every gender, um, but they accept the friendship request. They think, what's the worst that can happen? So what if a stranger wants to be friends with me? They look nice. Um, accept the friendship request and then get into a discussion with the individual, start exchanging messages, discover that they have lots in common with them, that this person seems to really like them, is really interested in their life, build up a rapport, and what feels like a friendship with somebody that they now feel that they know online. And this individual may then send them some photographs, some uh, video footage, getting explicit, and we'll ask for the same in return. We'll want some photographs or some webcam time with you um, taking your clothes off. And so the individual will respond because they'll think, well, they've sent this to me, so I'll send something back, and I now know them, and we have this chemistry online. And that's when, of course, you find out that this is not the person that you thought it was that you're speaking to. It's an organized criminal gang, and as soon as you send the footage, the images, then they will ask you for money. Otherwise, they're going to release these images. And these attacks have um, targeted particularly teenage boys across Europe, um, 900 teenage boys in the UK um, in the last year or so, according to police statistics, and a few of those have committed suicide. So it's a really serious attack, but what's behind it is the human impulse of temptation. And of course, another human um, bias that is taken advantage of in social engineering is our willingness and our desire to not confront authority. So when we receive an email, as the one I showed earlier that was sent to my client, it looks like it comes from your boss. You don't question whether you should follow the orders, whether your boss actually sent it. You just think, my boss has told me to do this, I must do it. This is the power of authority. So these are different triggers that are psychologically used to manipulate us all. But there are some other sort of more wide issues with the human side of cybersecurity that can make us all more vulnerable online. And this comes down to what's known as heuristics. So basically how our brains make decisions. And as humans, we often don't process all of the information in front of us when we make a decision. What we often do is rely on what's known as heuristics or shortcuts in the brain. We've developed these shortcuts over, over years and years of evolution, and we are aren't even conscious that we're using them. But one of the most prominent shortcuts or heuristics is what's known as social proof. Social proof is what is behind uh, TripAdvisor. It is what Airbnb built their business on. And this is, if an individual doesn't know what to do, they look to what other people are doing and they follow their lead. So we will feel like we don't know which restaurant to go to, we don't know where to stay, we look for reviews online. This is social proof. 
And so with cybersecurity, one problem we have is that all of the news is about how bad everyone else is online. All of the news is about how bad everybody's passwords are, about how nobody is taking care of their information. So the issue we have here is that everybody looks around and subconsciously thinks, well, I'm all right having a terrible password because everybody else does too. This, of course, is not the case. Just because everybody else is vulnerable doesn't mean you should be leaving yourself vulnerable. So the important thing with this is just to recognize that this bias is there and that just because other people aren't taking cybersecurity seriously doesn't mean that you shouldn't take it seriously because it is a real problem. Another bias that we have to confront and that challenges us is the um, optimism bias. And this is the fact that individuals all are predisposed to being more optimistic about their future. We, and this has been proven by um, decades of psychological research, we all, when we look ahead, we overestimate the likelihood of good things happening in our lives, we underestimate the likelihood of bad things happening. So when you ask individuals when they are about to get married, what is the likelihood of getting a divorce? Do you think that your marriage will end in divorce? Nope. People think there is a 0% chance that they will get divorced, even though the statistics are, what, 40 50% um, of marriages end in divorce. But people never think it will happen to them. And this is one thing I come across a lot with cybersecurity. Why would hackers want my data? It might happen to them, it might happen to them, it's never going to happen to me. So when confronted with this kind of optimism, what I see most cybersecurity professionals doing is trying to change this perception with facts by trying to say, well, there has been X amount of hacks in the last year. Just look at Uber, just look at Equifax, just look at what was happening um, to Macron and his team. And the problem with that is people will hear the facts but optimism is stronger than facts. People will know that 40, 50% of marriages end in divorce, but they still are optimistic. Facts make no difference. So I see a lot of my colleagues getting really frustrated with this. And when confronted with optimism, they just get more cynical and more pessimistic and more frustrated. And what they're not realizing is that actually optimism is really good for us. It's good for us individually. It's good for our own mental health health because people who are optimistic are less stressed, they're less anxious, um, they tend to lead more successful lives. But actually, when you're trying to engage with people, optimism makes people try harder. And essentially, this has been proven by psychological research, but it's also common sense. If you feel there is no point and that the sky is going to fall in, then why bother? But if you're optimistic, then of course you're going to try harder. So when it comes to cybersecurity, how can we be optimistic? We've heard just how vulnerable we all are. And of course, we are vulnerable. I'm not denying um, the threats that are out there and the risks that we all face. But there are actually things we can do, simple things we can do, things we can teach our children, things we can encourage our colleagues to do to make us all safer. And this is what we need to get our head, heads around. We need to all actually engage with the simple things we can do because most attacks take place via simple ways. It is not patching, not updating systems or devices, using poor passwords, clicking on links. All of the very simple attacks that we know are out there are far more common than the big scary zero days. And if we engage with these, then we can better fix cybersecurity. And so this is about reaching out to people and helping people be the strongest link. So what can we do? There are things organizations can do. And if you are a manager, if you run a team, then it's important to understand that from your perspective, this is about taking an attacker's eye view at the organization and at the team. Not just looking at what information is valuable to you, but what would be valuable to an attacker. 
In an organization like Hager, it's common when you are manufacturing, delivering goods to customers to think about security from that perspective. And I saw that this morning when I was briefed on the organization. And that's fantastic. Of course, you need to think about security in the products that you're making. But you also need to recognize the amount of valuable information that you have internally. And I'm not just talking about IP, but I'm also talking about employee personal data. I'm also talking about um, all of your financial details. And I'm talking about all the information that you hold internally that an attacker could get hold of and damage you in some way. So it's really about understanding what information you have, how it could be targeted and accessed, and also what you would do if you were compromised. So if you received an email like the one I showed earlier and transferred money, or clicked on a link, or gave away information on the phone, and you suddenly have that moment where the penny drops, and you're no longer in the hot state, so this is why the penny drops once you've done it, the pressure's off, and suddenly you realize you've maybe made a mistake. Do you know what to do? Do you know who to reach out to? Do the people who work for you know who to reach out to? And I'm not just talking about having an email address, because of course you may not have access to email, but have you got a phone number? Who do you ring if you suspect an incident? what people can do. And these are the steps, these are the basic things that you can do that don't take a lot of time, that don't take a lot of effort, but that do have an impact. And this is about being conscious of the links and attachments that you open and download. This is about understanding that people online aren't always as they seem and as they present themselves. This is about how you protect your accounts and having strong passwords, maybe using password managers, and using two-factor authentication. Who's familiar with two-factor authentication? A few people, mainly concentrated at the front. <laughs> so two-factor authentication is a double level of security on your accounts, and it's very easy to set up. There is a website called turnon2fa.com, and that talks you through how to set up two-factor authentication on all of your personal accounts not using public Wi-Fi, as Jamie said, unless you're using a VPN, backing up your data so you don't lose it, updating your devices, and of course, most importantly, understanding that there are no stupid questions in this space. People can sometimes feel like they don't want to ask a question about cybersecurity because they might think it exposes them as not knowing something, and people don't like to look like they don't know something. But it is so important to reach out, and whether that's asking questions of us today, or reaching out to your InfoSec team, or finding out the answers on Google, but just taking an interest, reaching out, and asking the questions that you need to know so that you can protect yourselves, your colleagues, and your families. And if you want to look at these top tips, if you want more information on them, then um, I run the website cyber.uk, and I keep an article on there that outlines these tips and more as to what you can do to better protect yourselves. But for now, I will say merci beaucoup.